statistical, so unpredictable here on the SNL Network. Yes, that is right. Welcome, everybody, on into the Saturday Night Network for another edition of SNL Stories, our podcast series where we get to talk to alumni of Saturday Night Live all about their time at the show and other great projects they are working on. And we have an amazing show for you tonight with a cast member that you have all been clamoring to hear from. So before we do that, let me bring in my co-pilot for the interview, James Stevens Jr. James, how are you doing? I am very well, John. Thank you for asking me. It's great to be here. And this is going to be a fun one because uh, people don't know this because it happened behind the scenes. But uh, this guy has already cracked me up. He's from Texas. Everybody that I uh, love, uh, everybody that I know from Texas is 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 on the top tier of, of friend level. So uh, this guy is no exception. Uh, we're going to have a great time. Absolutely. Well, without further ado, let's bring him in. You know him from his work on Saturday Night Live in season 47. It is the legendary Aristotle Atari. Aristotle, how are you? Wow, legendary. Yes, I so legendary. And also the clamoring part. I really I'm curious as to how many people are actually clamoring. Believe me. Yeah, I could tell you that. Uh, I mean, obviously, we were podcasting your entire season. There is nobody people wanted to hear from more than you. Like you, <laughs> you have a huge fan base out there of people who loved everything they got to see from you and just wanted to hear from you for over a year now. Also, what does clamoring look like? Is it like this? <laughs> is that clamoring? Uh, we need the listeners to tweet it to you yeah. or to put a, yeah, to put would, that out. Would there, love to know. Sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, well, let's get into it. We have so much to talk to you about today, so thanks so much for your time. Let's start with the beginning, about how you got into this field and into comedy, stand-up, and acting, and all that stuff. So how did it all start for you? Why did you want to do this? Well, um, I was always kind of a terrible student. I was never really, I just was never really good at anything other than being a class clown uh, and getting in trouble a lot. Uh, I was good at math, I'll tell you that. Uh, but pretty much everything else, uh, I just was not a very good student. And uh, I guess, I guess I knew comedy was the thing for me when I want to say it was like, like third or fourth grade. You know that that kind of thing where the teacher's asking, "Well, what do you want to do when you grow up?" and blah blah blah. And oh, I think it was fourth grade because I remember we I went to the same round of that kind of like you know uh that question you know in third grade and i remember the teacher said well what what do you want to do when you grow up and i kind of gave a very stock answer that i thought the teacher would like which was like you know i want to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever and uh and my reputation as a as a difficult student kind of followed me especially like those teachers they talk to each other so like after third grade, fourth, I mean, like all throughout my scholastic career, for the most part, like, you know, teachers would talk to each other before I would even enter the class, be like, you know, Aristotle's coming to class, here's some advice on how to deal with him, blah, blah, blah. And so the next year, uh, I had that same question asked of me, what do I want to do? And uh, I said, I want to be, uh, I think I said I wanted to be a doctor. And she goes, well, you're going to have to study hard and be a better student. And da, 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 da. And then the next year, I, I literally said, I want to be a comedian. And I remember the teacher saying, oh, well, that makes sense. And that, that, <laughs> that kind of stuck yeah. with me for some weird reason. And then ever since then, I thought, all right, I'll, I, that's what I want to do. But I still never really, I never really pursued it, uh, you know, with, with, fervor until like really early college years um up until then i thought i could be the funny version of whatever it is i did if i was an attorney i'd be a funny attorney with hilarious <laughs> closing arguments and like i would win the be like my guy didn't murder anybody come on you know like that kind of thing you know or you know or like a doctor with a very funny bedside manner kind of thing but yeah i just decided to really go for it uh early on in college yeah so that's I love that answer because uh, there are so many people, you know, it's like, I don't know, you, you hear these the true uh, comedians who have, you know, the fans or the, the people in the public come up to them and go, oh, my gosh, you know who else is funny? My uncle. You should see him. But, you know, sure. there are people out there who aren't in the in the comedic world. So let me ask you this, because it, it seems like when you say 
you were seeing ahead of the question being asked. You knew you were going to be asked. You you saw the answer in third grade or whatever is a fourth grade, and so you're you're going all right. I've 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 got this figured out. I'm going to say comedian and, and see where this goes. Were you? You said you were good at math. Were you involved in any kind of things outside of school? Like was it sports? Was it music? You know, were you artistic in the plays? Anything like that, or just you yeah. know, just wanted to come home? My my mom's side of the family was oddly very artistic and athletic at the same time. Yeah, so it 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 was a thing. It's definitely on my mom's side of the family. It was really it's really interesting. Um, you know, my cousins. Uh, I my one of my cousins is a dentist. And I, I see him work on, uh, you know, like when he's drawing out what he's going to do. I mean, like, and even my uncle, his dad, he's a contractor. And so uh, I would see him drawing, but they, but they were all started out as artists and then use that, um, uh, that ability to, you know, that, that ability to take what was in their head and kind of like create a conduit onto, you know, a piece of paper or whatever um into a career you know for my uncle it was like contracting my my cousin it was dentistry um but no it's it's the, i was always actually very i was a visual artist i used to draw a lot i was i'm still i still draw a lot I'm, uh it's cool yeah i would argue that you know uh i'm pretty humble about most of the things but like with art i'm pretty good i'm a good artist i can draw pretty well uh so yeah that was there was always that you know and then uh as far as like you know, uh, I did, I did improv growing up a lot, you know, like, I feel like a, a lot of kids, especially like me, when, you know, you have this, a lot of, this, a lot of energy and you're constantly like this behavioral disruption. I, I think a lot of teachers get it in their head that maybe he, this kid needs to try some improv and, try, you know, maybe that'll help kind of steer him in the right direction or her in the right direction. Um, and, and people I've, I've heard a lot about people who are, you know, suggesting improv for, you know, better listening skills or just, you know, communication, like, like speech, you know, talking in front of people and, and sort of problem solving all those kinds of things. So that's, yeah, yeah that's interesting. I mean, I've always had the, I've always had a dream to kind of like at some point, uh, I mean, not to really paint a ter like a terrible picture of who I was as, as a kid, but you know, I, I went to alternative schools as well. Cause I was constantly just like disruptive and, and my behavior was kind of, you know, I was never like, you know, I just was, my focus was just to constantly, you know, try to be the funniest person in the class. Cause that was really at that time was, was one of the only values that I had as a, as, as a member of that student body, because, you know, I grew up like my early, early years were in Texas. And so, you know, and my, my, my parents are from Iran. And so that was kind of very taboo, you know, I get, uh, there was always kind of like an asterisk next to who, who I was, you know, there. And so, uh, the one thing that I, that I, to my existence there. So the one thing that I kind of found, I, I discovered early on was that making people laugh got, got them on my side. And so that was kind of like my identity. Your peers you know? and your friend groups yeah, are just yeah, like, yeah. man, Aristotle, that was hilarious when you made the teacher upset by saying whatever, right? Or whatever, yeah. Or, or like sometimes, you know, yeah. Uh, that was just, yeah. That was the value that I brought to uh, to the class, and so you know, because I wasn't a great student, I did love soccer. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't great at it. Uh, uh, I wasn't bad actually. But yeah. who were you influenced by? Was there like you know people on TV that you were watching and you were like, oh, I really want to get into this field because of them. Uh, we often ask, you know, former SNL cast members if they had watched Saturday Night Live before they were on it because sometimes they see former cast members in themselves. Yeah, so when I was, uh, my mom used to uh, work at this alteration shop uh, when I was a kid and uh, she would just, she, could, she couldn't afford anybody. Like it was just me and her because um, she raised me, she raised me alone. She was a single mother. He would bring me to the alteration shop and there was always, there was a fitting room that I would just kind of sit in and there was a TV there and I would just watch whatever was on that TV. Um, and uh, there was no real signal, you know, to catch with the antennas. The only thing that I could get at the time was uh, uh, like reruns of old TV shows uh, and a lot of PBS. So like 
my early, early comedic influences were like Victor Borg, Borga. I don't know if you guys know who that is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I watched a lot of him on PBS. Uh, I, 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 to this day, he's like one of my, probably one of my largest influences. Um, uh, uh, I like, uh, a lot of, you know, early, um, uh, you know, Jack Tripper, um, you know, uh, Blue's Company, uh, like early, early. And then like, you know, um, cause this, this station, I'm trying to remember what it was called. Um, but they would play the, the cluster of shows they would play would be like, they were all reruns. It was, it was Three's Company, Mork and Mindy, Hogan's Heroes, and I think Get Smart. And I would just watch them over and over and over again. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think I, I think I pulled a lot from John Ritter. I think I pulled a lot from Victor Borga. Um, and then, you know, like when I started watching SNL, uh, it was probably one of the only things that I would watch with my mom, I remember, because she, you know, she worked really late. And, uh, and then we would come home. And I, I want to say it was after the news or before the news. I couldn't, I can't remember. And so, uh, and so she would kind of stick around. It was one of the only things she would actually had the time to sit and watch with me. So what was that? What was that? cast like you know growing up everybody has their cast kind of what what cast was would that have been for you then i mean i watched all i mean a a lot of casts from different generations because again like uh even at that time i remember they would play reruns of snl either af after the the current episode and they would go all sometimes it'd be classic ones um let's see like you know, I think I didn't appreciate Will Ferrell as much as I as much as I do now as an adult. I think when I was when you're when you're young and you're a kid, you kind of gravitate towards the more cartoonish uh, or like more animated performances. Um, you know, and to be honest with you, Living Color was pretty big. You know, uh, so you know, so you kind of, I did kind of split my time between those. And then Matt TV was actually pretty 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 big too kind of at the time and not not that in living color mad tv uh overlapped they did not but uh uh like some of my some of my favorite performers it's funny like if you ask me who my favorite performers are today they're very different than what they were when i was a kid because again my sensibilities were very different then um so let's go to the let- yeah, the kid, let's answer that, the kid, because I want to bring us to how you've sort of developed some of these characters over time. Well, none of the characters that I developed were, I don't think they were really influenced by any of the, um, of the, of my early SNL tastes or sensibilities, I don't believe. Um, but like, you know, the kid, the kid in me really liked, uh, you know, I, I I I did like Will Ferrell, but who, who stuck out to me as a kid again uh, was uh, um, uh, Chris Kattan stuck out to me quite a bit. Uh, oh, absolutely! Yeah, I was thinking you were going there because of the, you said you prefer the energetic performers, and he yeah. was like a ball of energy at the time. You know, as a kid, you know, like as I got older, you know, um, uh, some of my favorite performers of all time. You know, like I think Bill Hader's up there for sure. Um, I think, uh, Sherry O'Terry, I think, uh, you know, um, Amy Poehler, uh, but, uh, you know, as a kid, I really enjoyed, uh, I actually enjoyed a lot of Sherry O'Terry as a kid too, but, you know, like for example, uh, Molly Shannon was, uh, pretty animated as well, you know, um, and I really enjoyed her and Chris Kattan were kind of in that same you know, category for me uh, as a kid. Um, but yeah, you know, your taste, your Tastes change a little bit as you get older. Tastes change as you get older. So what? Maybe it's not one specific thing because you know we're always kind of this. Um, the version of us is is all the different things that have you know brought us uh, uh, you know all the different fingerprints and touch points throughout. But you know maybe it wasn't SNL. Maybe it was more Three's Company and, and the Mork and Mindy and the Hogan Heroes. But like, what do you do you have? Can you pinpoint? Maybe you can't where the influences on some of your characters, you know, pre SNL as you were 
as you were kind of um, out there on the road and, and doing some of this uh, work that really got you discovered and, and kind of well known? Uh, what what influenced you to kind of create those characters? Uh, I don't know. I mean, well, each character is like they're very specific. Uh, like where where the what the genesis of them were. I mean, I guess those are the ones that you've seen. Like for example, like Laugh and Tosh. That was a uh, that was a crank that was a crank call voice I used to do for a, as a kid all the time. You know, and as a teenager. Um, you know, it was kind of like everything was automated when you call places and you'd have to press one for this. And, and I used to do that when people would call the house. Um, and, uh, uh, that's kind of where that came from. Um, and then, uh, you know, I had, it was my second year, second year trying, well, my second year showcasing for JFL, um, characters. And that's the year that I got it. But the, uh, the prior year, you know, I was still workshopping a bunch of these different characters and then COVID happened and, and I kind of put the kibosh on it for, for a year. But um, I was trying to figure, I, I literally was uh, workshopping with a friend and I did the voice and then we just thought, okay, well, what if we did it as a, as a stand-up character and, uh, and using it as like, as like uh, doing like very kind of generic stand-up bits and whatnot. And originally, you know, the, the way I originally did it you know, I had this computer head that I had made and uh, it was mainly because to cover my mouth. So I didn't, cause I was, I was always cracking up doing it. Um, and it was a, it was kind of the philosophy of, uh, you know, the way Lauren really likes to do it at the show is he wants to see the face. He wants it to be, you know, connected and da da da. So they kind of pushed for this look that we ended up with at the show. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it took so long to get that on the air because we kept going back and forth. I really was pushing for a version of what I had already created. Um, and they were pushing to do it the other way. So, you know, um, and the, and the way the, and just to be clear, the, the Lauren or kind of show direction is, uh, not to mask you as much so that, so right. that the audience can see who you are. Right. Is that the, is that the gist? Yeah, to see your face and kind of like be able to connect the character with the the performer, I guess. Uh, but is that because you were new? Because like I could think of many veteran cast members, for example, even in last season where like Kyle would do Baby Yoda and like he would be practically unrecognizable. So do you think it, it was because uh, you're a newer cast member and then the thought is to connect you with the audience and that's why they wouldn't want to cover your face? You know, I don't know. I think, you know, like every time, every time I would kind of go back and forth about it, they would say, well, you know, Lauren wants, wants, wants to see your face doing it. I was like, okay. And, you know, at that juncture, you know, you just kind of take what you can get. Um, and I, I, I wanted to get the, the character on the air. Um, cause they're, they, you know, that's part of it is like, you're fighting to get your stuff on the air. Um, and so, you know, I was like, okay. And, and originally the idea was kind of like, he's this, uh, you know, because algorithms were like this thing. Everybody's like, you know, uh, like, a, a, like, you know, gathering information from the internet to do like, uh, you know, a, a creating a, a stand-up set based on a comedy algorithm. That was the idea of the whole thing. But yeah, you know, it turned into what it turned into. I'm happy with it. You know, uh, you know, again, I, I would have, I, I wanted to do the computer head. Uh, so yeah, uh, so that was kind of, you know, the, the genesis of how the Laughintosh thing came to be. Um, as far as like, uh, you know, like Angelo goes, Angelo was, uh, kind of a version of my mom in a way. Uh, my mom used to kind of speak English as if with, with confidence, as if she knew, like everybody knew what she was saying, but sometimes people would be like, well, what did you say? And so it was kind of a version of her. Uh, but you know, like I, 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 you know, when I look back on it, I did, I, there, there's a lot that, um, from like Victor Borg, Borg Victor Borger performances. And I would even argue like, um, I, I was oddly into a lot of, um, Buster Keaton, uh, that I think there's, there's a lot of that kind of living in the silence that I really enjoy as a performer. Um, uh, especially on stage, I think, you know, like be able, being able to milk you know, some kind of laughter out of silence on, on stage is to me is, is very fun and kind of magical. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, 
uh, yeah, toying with anticipation a little bit. Um, but yeah, originally, yeah, the, the Angela character was, was, uh, was less musical and more of, uh, just kind of like this, like a, like a mumbling kind of character who, you never know, really understood what he was saying, was trying to do stand up. And then a buddy of mine, who's a, who's a, I did his show and he's a, he's a musician and he played some piano to it and it turned into that. Um, but you know, like, uh, yeah. And I, you know, I, I kind of put those characters together for my showcase at, at, uh, JFL and that's kind of, yeah. Okay, well, I do want to talk to you about Just for Last and how you got on the show. So we'll table that for a second, sure. because while we're talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. Angelo, have to tell you, I mean, again, we're in the era of SNL now that recurring characters are like a dime a dozen, like it doesn't really happen. But what happened with yeah. Angelo was it just like recaptured the minds of everybody who grew up and fell in love with the show in the first place by seeing a character that was like, so different and fun. And when that first Angelo premiered with the Rami Malik episode, everybody was like, you know, what is this? <laughs> this is so good. So <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, for me, and I appreciate then, like, that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. And like, say for me was like, probably the biggest catchphrase of season 47. So, um, <laughs> you know, and then I know you did a couple others. There was the one from the Billie Eilish episode, the Christmas one that got cut, and then the wedding one from the Carmichael episode, I think one of those ended up online. But uh, did you realize like how much support there was for seeing this character? Both of them did end up online. Both of the uh, the Carmichael. Uh, but did, what was the question again? Did uh, I just want to know? Do you did you realize how, like, how much people appreciated and enjoyed getting to see this character because it really connected with the audience? You know, when you're working on the show, it's kind of hard to you're kind of in a bit of a vacuum, you know, and 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 if or I intentionally put myself in one because I I didn't really want to. Um, you know, you, you try to, you try to muster up as much focus as you can to try to get something together for that week. So, you know, um, the interesting thing with, with the whole, um, the Billie Eilish and the, uh, and the Gerard one was that, um, I was trying to save it for the next time we did it for Lizzo. Um, and then what happened was I'm trying to remember, I can't recall how, the Billy one came about. I don't know if that was something that I can't remember if she wanted to do it. I know that Gerard wanted to do it. That's a, that's a reason why that happened because, and I, again, I wasn't planning on pitching that with Gerard, but, uh, uh, he wanted to do it. Um, and, uh, and that's how that ended up happening. I can't remember how, and the other version, I had a different version for Billy. I mean, like the thing too is like, the the duality with with the the way that character works is that you know i i knew that the venue had to change a little bit i knew that there had to be some things that needed to change for it for it to work a second round and a third round you know you do see like the the, the traditional formula of of you know uh recurring characters on the show i knew was not going to work for for angelo i just knew that um, and the only reason being is because there are typically with, with a recurring character on a lot of the, on, on the show that you see, I don't really see, you don't, I don't think you really do see a lot of recurring characters in their own sketches. Usually they're always at the desk now these days. Um, you don't, you don't really see them. And my goal was to get them back into, uh, a full on sketch piece rather than them being, uh, at, at the desk. And so that was like, you know. If I if if I had two things that I was constantly fighting for was to get you know you know Angelo or a character to live in its own sketch rather than at the table and then also my computer head thing with the whole laptop. But um, but uh, uh, like typically with a lot of the characters that you see like recurring characters on SNL, a lot of the times there's enough moving parts, enough spinning plates in 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 the um, in the makeup of the character where you could change those plates up and it would still be like, you know, like what's up with that. Right. Which, um, cracks me up every time you do know he's going to end up in the song almost every time. Right. But there's enough moving parts, you know, like, uh, the, 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 the guests that are on the show and da da da. Like, you know, these things are, are, you know, th 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 there's enough moving parts that you could change those and still make it feel like it's kind of, you know, feel fresh and you, and, and the banter between them 
uh, you know, between Keenan and those and those people on the show, uh, in that mock show, you, you know, th- there's enough there to kind of create, you know, uh, uh, to, to be able to differentiate. No, absolutely, and and I no, I, I really like how John kind of described it because I think it's 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 brilliant in that. We are in a time, I think, where the reoccurring characters, as you said, Aristotle, are, are more frequently uh, behind the desk and they're, they're not right. sketch based. And, you know, it's kind of, I think, of a, of a time where just how people watch the show differently, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of just, you know, looking at the clips and things online, because it's reoccurring if you watch it again versus, you know, the, the, the previous uh, years where, you know, you wanted to see it again. You had to, to, to watch it, you know, live. Um, right, right, right. But but there was really, I think, as John described it, really some interest. Uh, people were hungry to see uh, more of of Angelo for sure. SNL is 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 a crazy place, um, as you mentioned. When you're there, you're kind of just you know trying to get the work done. Were there hosts, writers, cast members? Uh, you know who 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 rose to the top for you of people that just, you know, was really enjoyable uh, working with um, in terms of just any of those, those uh, touch points. Um, I mean, as far as like on the writing side, uh, you know, um, well, as far as like cast goes, uh, I'll say this because, because uh, Mikey was both a very strong writer is, is a very strong writer and a very strong performer. He's one of my, fa- he was one of my favorite people on the show. We, hang out and talk a lot. Um, also Moffat was, is, is, is one of my favorite people in general and just a very strong, was a very strong performer on the show. Um, the only person that I really knew from the show prior to joining the cast was, um, was, uh, 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 Melissa. Um, cause we started, we started at the same time, uh, doing stand up in LA. Um, so, you know, uh, and she was, you know, uh, she's, she's also one of my favorite people on the show. Um, Brian Tucker, one of the writers on the show, he, I, I really love Brian. I think Brian was, uh, very helpful and very instrumental in, in helping me getting, getting a lot of things off the ground at the show. Um, Brian and please don't destroy helps you with Angela, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, they both, uh, they both, uh, uh, worked on Angela with, with me. I think all three of them. Um, and, uh, you know, Brian is a very in-demand writer at the show. You know, we've worked a lot with Keenan, so it was very hard to kind of get him. Uh, you know, it was, it was hard to work with him on a weekly basis. That's the other thing, too, you know. Um, but, uh, and even with, like, you know, it, it, you know, it's, it's, speaking of Angela, it was, it, you know, it was kind of hard, you know, because, uh, like, with, with the second version of it, with the whole Billy one, my idea of, again, this goes back to the whole idea of the spinning plates thing, you know, like, I just knew that if we did it the exact way that we did it before, it would start to lose a little bit of what I, what, what I, you know, what I felt the character could bring to the show. So the original idea that I had was that, uh, Billy and her brother were at a, um, we're in a recording studio and they're trying to finish Billy's album. Producer walks in. He's like, you guys are, you, this album is overdue. You know, you're two months behind, you know, you need to finish, uh, you know, the, the final bits of the song is, and they're like, we're just, we're, and Billy and her brother are like, we're just, uh, we're blocked. We're, we're artistically blocked. Like, well, I brought in a song doctor. And then the song doctor happens to be Angelo. And then um, <laughs> with his like, it's yeah, a little nonsense. like, um, there's a little like Blizzard Man, uh, with Andy Samberg used to do something like that a little bit, but uh, I do I love it. Check it out. How did Blizzard but, Man go? So it was like, uh, it was like always like he had like a, like a really famous rapper that was like in the room and he's like ready to record. And then he was like, oh yeah, we have like a feature that's going to kill on this album. And in would come Andy Samberg as Blizzard Man. And he would just like do these not like, not like great raps. And then everybody else in the room was like, was like the crazy, like involved in the crazy. And they were like, no, no, this is great. This is great. And then it would be like ludicrous would be like, do you, are you not seeing what I'm seeing right now? And like, <laughs> Maybe, so, maybe that's, maybe, th- maybe that's why they didn't want to do that. Uh, but we ended up kind of just, yeah. Cause I remember pitching that. And I think, I think the note I got was like, you know, just don't, don't change what's already working. But I just knew that in my, in my heart, I felt like it needed to be a little bit more different. Uh, yeah. 
you you have the right idea for what it's worth because um, I I do believe that that is something that SNL has done so well over the years that they've gone away from, which is you know taking something that works and then putting it in a new setting to subvert your expectations. Um, yes, yes, you know, like, yes, yes. This year we had a couple like we had a sketch like Lisa from Temecula, this great ego sketch, and then they basically did a reprise of that for the second time. And you know that's the thing, that's the discourse that people are having, which is like, is it better to replay the hits or to change them up a bit? And I think you had the right idea with that. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, Brian Tucker was really helpful in in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, in regards to right, you know, the writing side of it. Keenan was also one of my favorite. Keenan was like one of the nicest guys on the show. Um, uh, I really loved Keenan a lot. Um, I mean, there was nobody that, you know, like, uh, yeah, everybody was pretty great. Was there a particular know? host that you were just, you know, jazzed about that was, you know, was coming in that year or musical? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I guess, uh, Owen Wilson was very, uh, I, I was excited about Owen Wilson. I think that was the first episode too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had originally, I had written an Angelo for that, for Owen, um, that didn't go, that didn't go forward, but, uh, but did very well at the table. Um, or no, no, that was laughing touch that did well at the table. Uh, but the, um, uh, Owen Wilson. Yeah. Because we had kind of similar upbringings a little bit. Like, uh, he was from Dallas. I was from Dallas. We'd both been kicked out of schools before, but yeah, I mean, Rami was really great too. He was, he was so energetic and so like, you know, uh, down to do anything. Um, who else was like, Billy was really exciting. great too. You can tell sometimes when they're just, they're just so psyched to be there, yeah. you know, Billy was really fun too. Like, I don't know if any, if you guys know this, but Billy's mom was a groundling. Um, really? I don't yeah, know. Billy's, yeah. Billy. Billie Eilish's mom, she comes from a comedy background. <laughs> like that's, her mom was crazy, wow. crazy funny. Yeah, Billie's mom was a was a groundling at uh, in L.A. and I think I think she even performed with like uh, Will Ferrell and a lot of those a lot of those guys. Uh, um, at the time, I think she was part of the, they, they were part of the same com- they were part of the company at the same time. Well, Arsal, can I ask you a little bit about how, you know, the process of getting onto the show? So you talked about Just for Laughs, which obviously was a very big deal to propel you in your career. Um, you know, what was the feeling when you were performing, doing those shows, eventually getting a big spot at Just for Laughs, being noticed by the show? And then eventually when you spoke to Lauren about becoming a cast member, could you take us through that process? Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, when I, when I first auditioned, technically for just for laughs. Um, it was in 2019 and, uh, didn't get it the next year for 2020, the audition started like early 2020. And then, uh, I did, we did the first round and then before we even got to the second round, COVID happened. And then we were kind of, you know, uh, stuck at home for a year and some change. And then when they were bringing the auditions back around, I was under the assumption that it's just a whole new year. They're going to start all over again. But what they decided to do is kind of pick up where they left off. And then they just went straight to callbacks. And so, um, and so then I got a callback for it. And, you know, there was a question as to whether or not uh, I wanted to do it or not, because I knew that they weren't going to be doing it in Montreal. To this day, I still have never been to Canada and I wanted to go. Um, and they were planning on having it, uh, locally in, in Los Angeles. And so I just thought, you know, like after, cause I had just kind of finished up Silicon Valley and, and I was, you know, there was some momentum going with Silicon Valley or after the show ended. And, uh, and then there was like a year of nothing. So I just didn't, I felt like the momentum was kind of dwindling away and I just thought, oh, I just got to do something. And so that's why I, I was just like, I don't, you know, at that point I was like, it doesn't matter if, if it's, if it's, if it's an LA uh, presentation of J- JFL, I just should do it anyways. Cause I didn't, I haven't done anything in a year. And so did the callback uh, and then eventually got the spot. We had it in at the, at the um, uh, dynasty typewriter theater in Los Angeles. And, you know, you just kind of do the thing. And, it, you know, for me, I just, I, 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 I just really wanted to have fun doing it. Uh, wasn't too focused on like, you know, um, 
who was there, who wasn't there. I actually assumed that nobody would be there because it was, it was like a, you know, I don't want to say truncated, but it was like this, you know, like uh, an abbreviated version in a way of, of JFL, you know? So it was just kind of like, it, there wasn't as many, it wasn't as big of an event as like the Montreal, uh, actual Montreal one. So I just didn't expect anybody to be there. Uh, some writers were at the, some writers were at the showcase. Um, and then, uh, and then I was asked to showcase, uh, at, uh, the Groundlings. And then I think that was like two weeks later, I do the ground and the Groundlings one was really interesting because they like, I don't know if you ever, have you guys been to LA? Yeah. I, I the closest I've been to the ground leaks though, is, uh, it was closed during COVID and I took a nice photo at, outside of the building. <laughs> Well, across the street or catty corner to the show, to the, to the venue, there's like, they have a big training center. Yeah. And yeah. so they had like, I think it was a total of, I want to say it was the, the number of people that showcased, I want to say it was somewhere in the neighborhood of like 20 to 30. I'm not sure. I think it was wow. actually maybe 20, maybe 20 to 25. I'm not sure, but it, it, they broke us up in two. There was like, the early show, the late show. And they had us across the street at the, uh, at the training center, all just kind of like there, we're kind of preparing, you know, and, and, you know, using the rooms to kind of prepare our thing. I'm they're putting on like my, my leotards and all that stuff. And, uh, and then they would, the funny part was they, then they would walk us over when it was our, you know, our, our group, which is the later group. And so I'm like walking across the street with like a computer head and like and, and a leotard <laughs> walking in. I love that. I'm just so, picturing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And with a bunch of us, you know, and then we go in there and you know, I I uh I I I I did the showcase and then after that I was like, okay, I felt very good about it. And then I just left. And to me, like in my mind, I thought, you know, kind of every step of the way, I just thought, all right, well, that was my uh that was a win for me just to be able to get to that point and do a good job. That's a win. Everything else is gravy or icing or whatever. And then, uh, and then they, they, they requested that I test in, in New York. And so I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> and it was a little, it, it was, it was funny because it's like my wife, like every, every step of the way I would be like, um, cause we were supposed to get married, uh, you know, or the date was in September to get married and uh and the showcase and and like the test were all around the like prior to that and i go listen i'm i'm gonna go i'm gonna go showcase for snl if i get it then i might have to go to new york and you know this might we might have to postpone the wedding possibly again and she was like she was like yeah yeah yeah, go ahead go for it and almost everything anything anything else that i talked to talk with her about that was potentially like would get in the way of our our of the wedding date, she would be like, well, wait a minute. And we would talk about it. She was like, all right, what are the possibilities? Da, da, da. But with SNL, she's just like, yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just like, <laughs> why does she not care so much? And I, and then, and then I, and I come back and be like, they want me to go to New York to test. She was like, mm, yeah, yeah, go for it. Have fun. And I was like, and my mind, I'm thinking, Oh, I don't think you think I'm going to get this thing. So that's why I just like, go do it. Um, but she came with me uh, to New York and uh she helped me practice uh my wife is like a consummate professional actor herself um and so uh you know i applied a lot of the um uh i i like i like personally being very precise with performances in a way and 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 like and then leaving some looseness in between little precise touchstones that i try to land on uh and she kind of helped me you know she's just she's she's just uh, that's my dog snoring by the way uh i don't know if you can hear that <laughs> No, uh, right. my dog snores so loud. Uh, uh, but anyhow, but she came to New York, uh, and I was nervous at first. And uh, you know, they bring you in to the studio, and uh, and then they kind of they usher you in, and then they hide you away in one of the dressing rooms, and then you just you don't exactly know when you're going to go up. Um, you just know it's this is basically this is basically in August. Is that no? This is in. This is in September. This was September eighth or ninth. 
or maybe yeah. seventh. Um, and so then I'm, I'm there and I'm in the dressing room in leotards and I'm freezing cold and, uh, <laughs> and I'm just, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. I waited for like four, four and a half hours. Um, and then finally they called me to go in. I, I was like a part of the later group as well again. And at that time, I think they were, they, they had looked at, so like, you know, you have the LA showcase, there's a New York showcase, and then there's a Chicago showcase. And from each one of those, each one of those showcases, they're, they're showcasing like 20 to 30 people. And then they select uh, another, you know, like, I think 10 from each one, something like that. And they bring them together. So there was like 30, 30 something people, I think maybe 32, I think it was maybe some of that neighborhood. And this is all on on one day the, in, in the studio uh, with the thirty. So they have the early people, and then and then they go to lunch, and then they have the after lunch group. Uh, from what I recall, you know, um, and then uh, I initially was nervous, but then to be honest with you, like when you and it, this has happened so many times, like when you watch something as a kid or when you watch something on TV, you know, the stage always looks a lot bigger and you're expecting it to be this gigantic thing and when i got there it was exactly what i had seen on on television but it was just a little smaller and mm-hmm. so that that tininess of it or the 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 reduction in size of it for me really kind of helped me just be like oh this is nothing this is just this is just a thing and so yeah. um and i just thought again i'm here this is a win for me um i'm just going to I'm just going to do what I want to do. And, and, uh, if it works, it works. If not, if not, if it, if it doesn't, it doesn't. Absolutely. And so, I, yeah. And so I did it and, uh, and I, I, I got laughs and, uh, I, you know, like kind of like 30 seconds in, you know, like it was a pretty strong audition. Um, do you remember who all was, who all was there, uh, observing, you know, they were to the, to, they were, so the cameras are here right in front of you. And then they're kind of like to the left and there was kind of two rows of people. Um, but they were all there. I mean, I, I know Lauren was like there and like, you know, there were just a bunch of people and I know Lauren was there and I, and I remember, I think I remember seeing Streeter there and I think I remember seeing, yeah, some of the writers. There's just a lot of, to process. Yeah. As you walk in there, it, but. In a, yeah, a little bit. And so for me, I just, uh, once I kind of got that first laugh, I just felt like, well, I, I have them now. I'm just going to do whatever I want. And then, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then that was that. And then, and then, uh, I remember after it was done, uh, went back to the hotel room and I, and I remember telling my wife, I was like, if, if they don't hire me, because it was a really, it was a good audition. I'll be honest. Uh, it was a good. It was a good test. Like if they don't hire me, then they're insane. And uh, <laughs> good, a good attitude to have on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, at that point, I'm just like, I know that I did it. I know I gave it. I know I gave a good test. It was a good performance. And I just thought, if they don't hire me, it has nothing to do with the performance, and it's something else. And I don't care at that juncture. And so, um, and uh, yeah, it was. It was just really interesting feeling that I had, and then. Can I just ask this real quick? The, the people for years have talked about how, you know, they go into auditions. You hear all these stories. Did anybody say anything to you? Like, uh, don't be surprised. They're not going to laugh. Like that was always one of the things. So did that, did that come up? Because you, you hear this, you hear this reaction. A dozen times. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think they, they do that to prepare you just in case it doesn't happen. But, uh, mm. but yeah, I was told that numerous times uh i was even told by chris who's like one of the the lead um you know uh stage manager stage managers there you know i I miss that guy he's such a great guy um yeah yeah, you know but but i just uh i was like okay cool and then you know the moment that i got the first first laugh i just kind of you know I guess I got a little greedy with it and I, and I really, really milked it as much as I could. And I went in there expecting to not get anything, you know, to, to not get anything out of them after so many times of people telling me that, you know, they're not going to laugh and then getting them to laugh. I was just like, fucking wow. Okay. And then, um, 
and then that, yeah, that was it. You know, like, again, I, you know, I, I always try to be very realistic about the situation. And so I was like, if they don't hire me, fine, but it has nothing to do with what I did on stage. It has, you know, it's something else because they were, they were enjoying it, what I, what I was doing. And then, uh, but then, yeah, like the next day, or that night, uh, my, my manager, who was, who was my agent at the time, he said, just expect them to, um, we're, we're, you know, if, if they, if they want you to come in, you know, they will call us, um, uh, for interviews. And I was like, okay, didn't hear anything. And I literally was like, okay, I guess that's it. I fell asleep. And then I got a call while I was asleep and he's like, Hey, they want you to come in for interviews. I was like, oh, okay. And I literally like, when I got there, I didn't really have any other clothes than what I had kind of, because so much of my stuff took up, you know, the, the one bag that I wanted to take with me. So I was like, all right, well, I got to get some like, like interview clothes. And so we ran over to like the little, I think it was banana Republic and got a shirt and whatever. And, and then, yeah, had the interview and they asked a bunch of questions at that juncture. There was like, I think, I think they had brought in uh, nine of us, eight or nine of us. Um, and then uh, they, including Sarah and James also. Sarah and James, uh, myself, uh, and then like five or six others. And then we were all kind of sitting there in the writer's room, uh, in the main, like the main center where the, where the writers hang out and they would just kind of come in, pull us one by one. We would go, you know, like for me, my first conversation that I had was with, uh, uh, the head writers, which is Anna, um, and, uh, Kent, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kent somewhat. And I'm trying to remember, my memory gets a little foggy, but, um, I remember, uh, yeah. So then I, I, uh, I interviewed with, 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 with them first. And then after that, I went and interviewed with, uh, the, the, the fellas, I guess, which are like the producers on the show. So there was like, you know, uh, Higgins and, and, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Streeter was there. Jost was there. Eric Kenward. Kenward was to my right. Yeah. Kind of sitting there. Uh, and this is all on 17. Is this up on 17? This was on 17. Correct. Yeah. And then, yeah, just, you know, like for me, I, you know, I was just trying to be uh, personable and, and just kind of, you know, whatever my, just my, not, my, my normal way. And, uh, you know, they asked me a lot about my, you know, well, uh, Higgins asked me a lot about the direct because I directed a lot prior to um, getting on the show. So I had like, I guess they had looked at the IMDb and they saw that I had worked on, that I had directed a handful of things um, and asked me what that was all about. And I, I explained what that was all about. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and that was it. And I actually thought at one point, oh, and then after that, uh, I met with um, Shookus and then... Mm -hmm. And then after that, I was like, okay, I was not prepared to, to meet Lauren at least right away. And then she's like, okay, I think it's time for you to go meet Lauren. And I was like, and I literally asked, her, I was like, can, can you give me like five minutes? Like, just, <laughs> just, 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 just give me five. She's like, sure, sure, sure. And then, so I kind of, I kind of was like, all right. And I thought about it. And then he was standing at the door and I was like, all right, I guess I just got to go in there. And I went in there and I'm usually pretty personable, very rarely tongue tied, very rarely. And I was extremely tongue tied. I did not. I, I felt like if, if there was any part of this whole process that I felt like I blew it, it was in my, it was in my interview with Lauren. Okay. Yeah. Cause like he, his, his opening was very sweet. He goes, you had a very good showcase, but uh, he goes, you yeah, know, but I think you know that. I was, I was about to go into my Lauren impression, but I don't know if I should do that. Uh, <laughs> Lauren impressions are always welcome. Everybody has one. It's like, uh, well, Aristotle, you know, you did, you had a very good showcase. And I think you know that. And uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. And um, yeah. So uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that's, 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 that's Lauren today. I mean, he has that kind of like, he goes, yeah. Uh, yeah Aristotle, you do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, he sat me down and I was sitting, sitting across his desk from him 
Oh, oh, he shook my hand and I said, I'm sorry, I have sweaty hands. He's like, you know, hands get sweaty. Um, <laughs> hands get sweaty. <laughs> I, yeah. that, made, that one made John laugh out loud. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, a yeah, great yeah. Lauren one. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Had to sweat it. So, uh, yeah, big it's sweating. So, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then sat down. And then he's like, Do you have any questions? And or I can't remember what he said. I just remember being like, This is the room, you know, like on the wall, there was like, you know, names of potential guests and like, or hosts and like, you know, the, the week and the musical guests or the musical act and all that stuff and i'm just like this is this is the room and it was really nerve-wracking oh oh his, and then after that when he sat down his opening to me after that after he com, com, you know complimented me on my showcase and that he's like you know i don't know what to do with you so and i was like okay uh <laughs> and and i was I like this. yeah and i was like uh well yeah i guess i guess i and i, and I, I think i said I, I rarely know what to do with myself. Um, uh -huh. And then uh, he asked about, I was a huge Kids in the Hall fan growing up. Um, Excellent. And yeah. so uh, I remember, I remember telling him, I said, I said, eh, you know, I'm a huge Kids in the Hall fan. Just want to let you know. And I think he looked at me, he goes, thanks. Thanks. And I was, and I thought, all right. And I actually believe if I'm, after everything that I had said, I can't even remember. It was kind of a blur. Um, I just remember thinking to myself, I got to get the fuck out of here or I'm really going to shoot myself in the foot. So I kind of ended it a little early. I was like, well, thanks so much for, for seeing me. He's like, okay, great. And, uh, and he walks me in the door. And then the only sign that I had that he, um, uh, that he was interested in hiring me was that he told me before I left, he said, uh, he said, we'll find something for you. And so in my mind, I thought, all right, well, they're going to hire me as a director um, or potentially a writer. Just because so much was asked, so many questions were asked in regards to like my directing. Um, and so, yeah. and yeah, so I was kind of like, okay. And so I told my wife that I told like, you know, my agents that and all that stuff. And, uh, and that was very common too. people, you know, will showcase, they'll get hired as a writer. But I, I thought only because they asked me about my directing so much, maybe they had, cause I had, I, I, I had, you know, pretty extensive resume doing, I mean, not extensive, but like, you know, it was enough for them to ask about it, you know? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I was literally, and then flew back home and then, uh, it was like four days later or five days later, I was literally, it was on a Monday. We were supposed to get, I was supposed to get married that Saturday. And I was at like Bevmo trying to shop for, you know, alcohol for the wedding and trying to, trying to find cheap, cheap beer that everybody would love. And I'm going back and forth with my wife. And, uh, and so, and I, and I, and I realized that, oh, I could get this beer cheaper at Target. <laughs> I was like, so I went to my car. I was literally just like Google Maps, Mapsing Target where it was. And then I get a call and it says on the, on the caller ID, Michael's Lauren. Lauren and I was just like I was like this can't be real and so I was gonna take a snapshot of it right there but I was worried that I would actually hang up on him and I also like was legitimately concerned for my mental health because I thought am I hallucinating right now is this real <laughs> and so when I picked up the phone he answered and so th at that point I took a snapshot of it happening just in case after I got off the phone I could just like look at it and be like okay that definitely happened and that was it. He, he, he asked me if I wanted to join the cast. I was like, yes. And I got out of the car and I thought, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And then I was like, fuck this alcohol right now. I just went to go buy a bottle of wine or champagne. And then I went to go meet my agent because my agent was playing soccer uh, at, the, at the Pan Pacific Park. And I was like, where are you? Just tell me where you're at. He told me, or his wife told me, or his girlfriend at the time told me, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go meet him there. And I went to go find him. And, uh, and I told him he was all sweaty and nasty playing soccer, but I, I, I hugged the shit out of him. And I told him that, uh, that I got it and that, uh, and that he, him, and then him, me and him went to go tell my wife, uh, hmm. and we showed up 
uh, with the champagne. And my wife was like, why is Matt here? And then I think she already <laughs> knew. She saw the champagne and she started crying. And that was it. It was, mm. it was a very, it was a very touching moment. It was very nice. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with all of that with us. Cause I think the, the listeners are going to be fascinated with the whole process and everything like that. And I'm sure, um, that will always be like meaningful memories for you. So I appreciate it. Yeah, no um, worries. Can I just say, John, I know you're getting ready to go to another thing, but to, you know, we've uncovered the, Hey, they're not going to laugh. And then one other thing that has just sort of, uh, been a comment, uh, about Lauren and the hiring process that is of legend, I think, is that, uh, so many people have said they've not really gotten the official, like, am I hired or whatever? This sounds like a very, very direct Lauren going, would you like to join the cast? Which is right. Which is way cool. Wait, are you talking about like in the office? No, by the phone. Like he usually doesn't. Oh. We've heard he like doesn't always say. He's like, okay, I'll see you on Monday, and then you're like, wait, I'm hired. But like, <laughs> right, um, right. But oh yeah, like you, he called you and he was like, no, no, you, you got the job. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I've ever heard that it, it being kind of like up in the air. I know that the the interviews are always kind of up in the air. Like you can't really tell if you're hired or not. Uh, but I think when she, once you get the call, I think it's pretty straightforward. They're you know cool. I, I haven't anybody that I've ever talked to in regards to um, existing cast or even people that uh, that auditioned with me. They were. Yeah. The phone call was pretty much like, hey, you, you, you got the job during the show. Well, and it's very cool that it's long, like it's not that one of the head writers, which would be the, the news is fantastic regardless. But here is the man, uh, Michael's comma Lorne <laughs> calling you in the parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never forget it. Arsal, I do want to ask you, you know, obviously we talked about how you got on the show and then some of your, you know, best characters that we got to see. And, you know, throughout season 47, there was moments where we really wanted to see more of you on the show and we didn't always get that. So are you able to talk, you know, to us and the listeners a little bit about some of the difficulties and challenges of the SNL process and getting pieces onto the air, obviously to your comfort level from what you went through in season 47? Yeah, I mean, look, it was it was a very very large cast. It was a very large cast. Um, it was like 21, 21 people in the cast, un- officially, unofficially, twenty four if you count PDD. You know, there was just a lot of there. You know, and you only have so many. Uh, you only have so many. Um, there's, there's a finite number of of spots that you can get for dress rehearsal, um, and it's like you know you're you're just trying to get you know t- the table reads i think at the time they were just they were difficult in a lot of ways because we were still heavily we were masked and separated and you know so there was there was a, a, a lot of you know like there were a lot of growing pains in that regard trying to like be funny from a mic you know and covered and it was just that that was it was it was kind of difficult um but yeah i think i think a lot of it was attributed to the fact that there's just like such a large it was just a large cast and um and uh and there was just only a certain number of spots available so do you think you would have had a better shot had it been uh you were hired like let's say for this year where there's a smaller cast and a lot of people had left the show i i also think well i i think another thing too would have probably worked in my favor more so is that is if i knew anybody there um and i didn't i only knew melissa uh as a performer um, I didn't know any of the writers. I know that, you know, like, uh, James and, and Sarah, they, they both knew a lot of people there already. Um, uh, you know, I just didn't really know anybody. I, I just, if, I, I, and, and, and I, even, even the, even me knowing, not knowing people like, you know, I think Brian was so gracious with his time with me. Um, uh, I just really enjoyed, I just really enjoyed that that guy is a human being as well, but yeah, just, you know, I just didn't know anybody. Um, if I, I think, I think, I think that would have also helped a lot if I, if I was familiar with, with some of those people. Now, the, the funny thing is, is like mid season, um, they did hire, they hired Rosebud Baker as a writer. And I had literally the last directing job that I had was, was directing her last special. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so that was, so there was some familiarity there, but even even then, it was like I had only known Rosebud uh, from directing her special. I didn't know her really prior to that. Um, so again, it was just kind of like you know trying to because because I think that's a huge part of it is as a performer when you're there, if you if you can't solidify a, a 
a, a good relation or like, you know, like a, a, a bond with, with one of the writers um, or a group of them, then I, it, it can become difficult to get stuff on. Uh, Cause then you're kind of a little bit of an Island, a lonely Island, if you will, um, trying to get things on the air. Uh, but that's kind of, I think that was, I think those are the two factors that played in a lot, played, played into um, the difficulty of getting anything on the air specifically for me, it was just a, like the cast was just very large. Um, and then, uh, and also, um, you know, the, the, the table read situation was a little, was different. I don't know if it's any, di any different now, but you know, I think it, it was, uh, I think that was the first year they had been like that. Maybe the year prior, I actually, the year prior to that, I think they were all, they didn't even meet. They were all at right. home. Right. Um, Had to so, be you know, just so challenging. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was a challenge. And then, and then on top of all that, you know, just, I just didn't know anybody, you know? Yeah. We talk a lot about alliances between the cast members and the writers. So yeah, um, yeah, that yeah. is a huge factor. And yeah. I understand that. I do also want to ask you about uh, representation when it comes to SNL, because that is, you know, you know, going back, you know, a few decades and eras, I mean, the, the cast, you know, was a lot of white people and, uh, you know, wasn't wasn't representative of, you know, a lot of fans that wanted to watch the show and get into the show. They didn't see themselves on the show. And when you were hired, I mean, only, I believe, the second Iranian American or Middle Eastern uh, background yeah. uh, cast member. So yes. uh, Nassim Pedrad obviously was uh, there prior to you. But just you know, how did that, uh, you know, did that did that resonate with you at all when you were there? And did you get reached out to by fans and stuff like that from from that type of background who really felt like they connected with you yeah I, I did get reached out to a lot uh quite a bit um and yeah it, it it did it did resonate with me but i do have this weird habit of you know uh putting on you know horse blinders and just trying to focus on the thing that you know is in front of me and you know the, you know not to say that any of those things would be a distraction to me but you know like uh sometimes i didn't i, I didn't know like how many people were interested in like, you know, the character Angela or anything that I was doing. Cause I was just so focused on trying to get something, uh, on the air, you know, and, you know, uh, and trying to, trying to cultivate, you know, some of these relationships with the writers, you know, I mean, like the thing with Brian, that was like, you know, the, the, the duality to that was that, you know, he's such a great writer. He was also a very in demand writer and, and very busy. So it's like, you know, uh yeah it it was it was just one of those uh uh so yeah like the the, the representation thing yeah it, it, i think it was yeah it, it was important to me i don't know if i uh it would hit me a lot i don't know if i registered it if that makes any sense yeah, well, I just I do want you to know that we have you know all different types of fans who of Saturday Night Live who check out the podcast, and we got to hear you know as a bridge between you know you at the show and then the fans. We got to hear from a lot of people who were just um, so thrilled that you were on the show and representing them. So I want you to know that. I appreciate that. Yeah, it was great. You know, like yeah, I, I, I was I was I'm very I'm very grateful and very very fortunate to to have been able to represent um, you know because there there was never really that for me growing up ever you know uh and so i hope hopefully um you know a little version of me that's out there or whatever not not like not some illegitimate child or anything you know what i'm saying like <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah there it like is. a kid a little troublemaker you know uh uh who may have like a little bit of a hard time fitting in maybe he sees like oh even though i you know i i didn't i didn't have a lot of um uh, there wasn't a lot of time on the air, but you know, maybe, maybe they caught something and I don't know. You never know. I think they did. Well, and re related to that, the, the current fans, the future fans, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Molly and Max in the future. Sure. This, is, yeah, yeah. this is really exciting. I think it, uh, premiered in March, uh, at the South by Southwest. So, uh, what can you tell us about that? This sounds really very, very interesting. Something different, a little, a little different. Well, um, it was, uh, I, I literally started shooting it, uh, I think like a week or two after we were done with the show, if not maybe uh, something in that neighborhood. Um, it's basically like, uh, you know, when Harry met Sally, but in space and in the future, mm -hmm. um, uh, my, co the, my co-star is, uh, or the person, the, the other, the other lead in the film is, uh, Zach Mamet, um, who was a pleasure to work with and very professional and really, a really good, really good actor. Um, it was very effects heavy. So it was kind of, there was a lot of like acting to nothing. Um, hmm. 
you know, a lot of LED screens uh, and some green screen here and there. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I think, I think, uh, seeing it for the first time was actually very interesting to me because you just don't know what it's going to look like. Um, and, uh, having that opportunity to, to see how all the pieces kind of fit together was, was really, was really uh, rewarding and, and fascinating. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what it is. Uh, it, it did, it did well at the South by, um, I know that they had a, they had a screening of it or a couple of them in new york it's been it's been running the festival circuit so yeah it's something I'm, i did another thing right after that too called the french italian which i have not seen anything from but that was really fun to shoot as well so hoping to see that uh, yeah what could you tell us about soon. tell us about that one the french italian the french italian i it was me me and kat cohen um and then uh ruby mccallister um she's also in it and then uh Chloe Cherry, she's on Euphoria. Like it was, it, it was, it, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a, it's a comedy. It's uh it's about me and Kat Cohen. We're a couple and uh, trying to get revenge on a neighbor who's driving us crazy. It's pretty fun. Actually, Renitsky's in it too. John Renitsky's in it. Um, oh, no. oh, how fun! Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it, it. I had a lot of fun shooting that film, so I'm I'm interested in seeing uh, what that looks like, or you know, just seeing something from it. But I shot that literally right after molly and max and that was that was in new york as well um but yeah we should get all the one season snl cast members into a movie together like how oh yeah 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 I? i've thought about that to be honest with you because I, I i know a couple of them i know john i know brooks um uh uh noel noel wells i don't know noel wells uh millheiser i know um who else there's just, I mean, well, I mean, if there's, you go there's back a lot, far enough, yeah. there's, there's, there's a lot. Robert Downey Jr., there's, there's a ton. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to know, you know, before we uh, wrap up today, uh, any other like future projects or goals or anything that you want to tell the listeners to check out? Because like I said, I mean, these are people who've been following you for most of your career and really want to continue to support you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm currently on a show now. Uh, I really would love to tell you, but I've been told not to say anything about it. Uh, no problem and it's not and it's not it's really not it's not like this it's it's a it's a big it's a big show i'll tell you this it's a big show on hbo uh i'm i have a i have a, a small recurring part on the show uh so that was but that's been really fun to shoot um uh uh but i can't say <laughs> i really want to but apparently i'm not allowed to say what it is how about this when, when you got something big to promote Come on back. We'll love Absolutely. to get to talk to you a little bit more. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. That'd be great. Hear some more of your stories because yeah, uh, yeah. this was this was honestly fantastic just to get to hear everything from you. I'm sure there's like more in and inside information about like some of the episodes sure, sure. that you were at SNL that we can get to cover with you in the future. So I just really want to thank you for your time. Hey man, thank you so much. James, always a pleasure, buddy. Great job today. Oh no, it was uh, my, my uh, it was thrilling. I mean, we drawings from the early uh, sketches from from Aristotle uh, to hear the Lorne impression and and even uh, audition and interview things. Uh, this was this was a great one. Absolutely. Well, if you're enjoying the content you get to see here, we have so many great other SNL stories you have to go and check out. Like last month, we spoke to Mikey Day. Great to talk to him. From this season alone, Bobby Moynihan, Paul Schaefer, so many great former cast members we got to talk to, and we have more coming up this summer, so I look forward to that. Right now, we're wrapping up season 48. We have all of our postseason coverage, so if you missed our postseason roundtable, that just came out. And then coming up on Thursday night of this week, we have our final By the Number show, where Mike Murray will be back to go through all the analytics and screen time from the season we're going to go through cast member by cast member so you are aware of what was happening from season 48 all right for james stevens and aristotle atari my name is john schneider from the saturday night network we will see you next time everybody have a good one